Welcome back to Dion Talk. What appliances do you or do you not put in a rental? This video comes to you thanks to a question from Nicholas. Can you do a video on appliances? For instance, the dishwasher works but doesn't clean as good as they want. Do we need to buy them a new one? Also, do you recommend we include appliances or not? Dishwasher in the rental or not, etc. So I'm going to cover all of the different types of appliances that can go into a rental, whether I supply them or not, and the thought process that goes through how I acquire them or when to replace them. The purpose of my content is to help the average individual realize that you can reach financial freedom in 10 years or less, make work completely optional, even if you're, stop, even if you're not starting from the best position. I did it through buy and hold real estate with small multifamily rentals. I retired in 2022 with 16 rentals that produced a little over $204,000 in pure cash flow. To do this, it takes systems in place. I am the lazy investor. I am not an entrepreneur. I am an investor. I wanted to take money and put it to work. So what I did with my rentals was figured out a way to do this where it takes the least amount of time, energy, and effort on my part to provide a good product to my tenants. It does make it a lot easier to find cash flowing rentals on the MLS since I have the binder strategy that gets my tenants to ask me to raise the rent. So when I'm looking at appliances, the first thing from this question that Nick asks, asks about is dishwashers. If it doesn't clean as well as they want it to, do you replace it? When I acquire a rental, I like to have tenants in place. If that's the case with the dishwasher that's in place that was there before I bought the property, so I don't know when it was acquired, whether it's under warranty or not, I have a Dion talk with my tenants before I replace a the dishwasher. There are a couple of things that can happen. In the 90s, it might have made sense to hire a mechanic or a repairman to go and look at a dishwasher and see if there was something they could fix. I can find when there isn't a pandemic going on and a delay in getting products delivered, uh, most dishwashers brand new are three to $400 for the ones that I like. I don't need a super fancy one. And there's really no cost difference to get stainless steel front versus white plastic front. It's like 10 or $20 difference. A lot of tenants still come from the mindset that stainless steel costs a lot more. So if you get stainless steel, make sure you have the talk with the tenants that you only wash it in line with the grain of the stainless steel. But before I replace a dishwasher that the tenants are saying, this doesn't clean as well as we would like it to, I will explain that a dishwasher has a filter. Make sure the filter is clean. There can be a tiny piece of plastic on the filter that stops it from draining fast enough so the water will build up. Instead of the jets actually cleaning your dishes, it's just moving water around in there so they won't get clean. That's the first problem that can happen. The second problem is that if the tenant has been using a dishwasher and putting in uh, plates or pans that have any kind of grease on them, bacon grease, cooking grease. What happens is that gets solid on the, on the pans. And when you put it in the dishwasher, the average temperature of a dishwasher goes between 130 and 140 degrees. This liquefies the grease. So it's cleaning them, gets it out of there. But then it goes into this nice little white plastic drain tube and goes out and the temperature quickly congeals the grease to solidi solidify in that white tube. So if I send a handyman or a replacement person to go and replace the dishwasher and the filter is not clean or the drain tube is full of grease, the repair costs are going to be the tenant's problem. If those aren't the case, I replace the dishwasher. It should perform correctly. Then I will have a date and timestamp in my, my book, my uh, entire real estate portfolio was held in this book. Each property gets 10 pages. In those 10 pages are things like the mortgage, the, the uh, insurance, when the roof was replaced, when the dishwasher was replaced, so that I can find it and know about how long I should expect at least to be under warranty or it should continue to work. I do not repair dishwashers other than making sure the drain hose is clear and that the, the, the filter at the bottom is clear so that it will drain fast enough for it to actually function correctly. The cost of repairing is usually the same as putting in a new one, and a repaired one doesn't usually come with a warranty. I do not buy used dishwashers. Find a new source. It can be Lowe's, Home Depot, a local source in your area. There's an appliance place that I've gone to in Lakewood, Washington, and I forget the name. It's 
not the used place that I go to where I've gotten some dishwashers. So that's the first one to answer Nick's specific question about dishwashers. But let's go through some of the other appliances that can come up in a rental. After dishwasher, let's go with the garbage disposal. So this isn't so much an appliance that people think about because it's not visible, but it is an appliance that's in the kitchen of, of properties. And so I know that <clears throat> if I live somewhere, I probably want a garbage disposal. And I know tenants do too. So I have a hard and fast rule if I have a septic system. Now my properties are about 50-50. I actually prefer a septic system over sewer. All of the problems I've ever had have generally been sewer. And the one time I had a big septic system problem, it still, even though it was $17,000, was significantly less than I would have paid for sewer. So if you have a septic system, I don't want a garbage disposal. I want tenants to understand what can't go down the drain so that the system doesn't get clogged up or need to be replaced anytime sooner than necessary. But on a system with sewer, I also don't put garbage disposals. It is something that isn't required, doesn't increase the rent if it's already installed, and is another maintenance item. The reset button on the bottom can be a conversation you might not want to have with some certain tenants, so it could call out a handyman to push a reset button. Do you want people sticking their hands in to clean them out? No. So generally, I don't want them. I have had a tenant ask for one on a property that does have sewer, so I'm okay with being there in sewer, and it had to be installed. The cost to have it installed was about $400. I said, I generally don't have garbage disposals in my units. You're already living there and you're requesting it. If you would agree to a $20 a month increase in the rent, I will have it installed and then I will maintain it in the future. $400 to have it installed, $20 a month increase to the rent, tenant was happy to pay that. That's a pretty good return on my money and it justified me having to maintain it in the future. So generally no, but if paid for and not on septic garbage disposal, I will do. After garbage disposal, we'll look at the refrigerator. Know your local laws and regulations. I have not heard of anywhere where appliances are required by the owner, but what's normal for your area? If you're in an area where people bring their own refrigerators, don't supply one. I'm in an area where almost every rental that you see listed already has a refrigerator. So because of what is normal for the area, I will provide a refrigerator. I don't do a very fancy one. I'm in class C properties, so this doesn't have to be glass front, talks to you, orders your food for you, connects to your Wi-Fi. I don't even want double door. I go with a simple seven or $800 refrigerator, whatever's on sale at Lowe's or Home Depot at the time. Uh, single uh, door, fridge on the bottom, freezer on the top. I do have a tenant who wanted a bigger, nicer refrigerator. I said, that's fine. We can move mine to the refrigerator and you can put one in yourself. And so they have mine in the refrigerator and it's a backup refrigerator. My refrigerator to the garage. So it's a, it's a now backup refrigerator, soda fridge, whatever they want to call it. And they have their own there. I'm okay with that. I don't maintain or replace theirs, just mine. Same thing with the dishwashers. I do not buy refurbished or used refrigerators. The cost of seven or $800 that comes with a warranty, free delivery, $40 fee to haul away the old one and hauling away the old one yourself, even at a dump now has about a hundred dollar charge in my area because of the free on to get rid of it. So for me, it's better to have them hauled away and not usually worth having them repaired. When you have a refrigerator delivered, make sure you talk to the tenant in advance. If, if they're there, if, if you're the one with a vacant unit doing a uh, a rehab before a tenant turnover, look at the layout of the kitchen and make sure you know which way you want the door to open or to not. And so when the technicians deliver the refrigerator, a normal standard part of their job is to switch the way the door is laid out so that it will open the way that works best in that kitchen there and interchangeable for the single door refrigerators. Those are generally plug-in runs on 110. The other thing to consider with the, the Dishwashers is there's two versions. One is hardwired in with electricity that you would want an electrician or a qualified handyman to take care of, depending on your area. It could be in, you yourself can do it if you live in the unit. Uh, and there's another version that is plugged in that doesn't require a, an electrician to change it out. So you have those kind of things to consider. We'll talk about washers and dryers when it comes to the types of plugins too. So after the refrigerator, we look at the stove. Now I do provide stoves in my units. Again, Class C rentals in an area where I don't want to go too fancy. 
I do use, I do acquire used stoves, find a local provider. Uh, I've found stoves from $300 to $500 that are ceramic top that I prefer much because we're in Washington. There's so much moisture. The um, coil spring top stoves uh, rust and even the pans rust. So I want the glass ceramic top. I don't do gas. I deleted again all the gas system in the property that I live at. Again, in a class B or class A or super nice area, gas might get you a premium on rent. It doesn't in a class C area because area average rents set rents. I'll use do the used stove because they're cleaned. Uh, the place that I have has a one-year warranty, free delivery, free hallway of the old one. Uh, look around for your non-big box stores for that kind of service. Uh, the one I use in Lakewood, Washington is, no kidding, called TV Time Appliances. Great customer service, great, not had a problem with them. Um, when you plug in a range, depending on the age of your, your rental and the age of the range that you're buying, there are two types of cords. There's a three-prong 220 cord and a four-prong 220 cord. When you get the new range, I don't switch out whatever um, outlet my wall has, right? You can have an electrician come and do that. I've had them come and repair them when there was an issue. But what I'll do is I'll switch out the cord. So before the technicians haul away the old range, that range was plugged in. So it has the correct cord for that outlet. I will take a look at the new stove to figure out if it has the three or four prong and switch it out. It's only three or four little screws, very easy to do. If you're not comfortable, hire an electrician um, for the install. Usually the technicians will handle that when they get there. So that's for the stoves. After the stove, do you provide a microwave? No. Counter space for a microwave, yes. Um, hoods above the oven, oven uh, for venting can have a microwave in them and cost a couple hundred dollars or you can buy the 40 to $60 hoods that look nice and are new um, to replace that don't have a microwave. I don't want something that can break that I need to maintain. So they're welcome to ha <clears throat> have and use a microwave, but I don't provide those. After the microwave, the big one for me is washers and dryers. This is the one that takes the most logic to work our way through. I only want to own rentals that have a washer and dryer hookup in each unit. I don't want shared laundry. I don't want to try to make extra money from a coin-operated uh, system because tenants using a laundromat or shared laundry are generally waiting for a place to open. So one of my strategies to help limit tenant turnover is to make sure that there's a washer dryer hookup in each unit. But do I provide the washer and dryer? I love it when you have something where you hang out and talk for a couple of hours every now and then and your voice starts going up. It's good stuff. But at least I'm over the plague. It's now just my voice is going. I think the water that makes my eyes water might help. At least it helps with the overshares. I do not provide a washer and dryer. I do not want to be responsible for it. There's too many times where tenants, if, if they know it is not their washer and dryer and it is maintained by somebody else, they will completely overload it. They will, like the dishwasher, say that it's not cleaning well enough because they overloaded it, because they used the wrong detergent, because they had it on the wrong setting. Whatever the reason is, my first couple of years I had washers and dryers in my units. I do not do that anymore. As long as there's hookups, Tenants are welcome to put in their own washer and dryer. It's connecting two hoses and plugging in a couple of cords. It's not a very hard thing to do. I do have a tenant that just moved in recently and they didn't have their own set. So what I do have is an old washer and dryer set that a previous tenant left behind and I keep it in a storage shed on one of my properties that my tenants, if they move in and don't have their own set are welcome to use for a few months until they acquire their own so that they don't have to move in and have First month's rent, prorated days, deposit, wrap it all together, and then go buy a washer and dryer set. That could be expensive. So they can use this at no charge. And this gentleman um, didn't seem to want to install them himself. Didn't seem like he had the confidence to do it. So sure, I can go do it. Instead, I gave him the handyman's number and I said, I have a set that you can use that aren't mine and I don't maintain, but you're welcome to use them. If you want them installed and you don't want to do it yourself, here's the handyman's number. He'll probably charge you $100 to swing by and stick those in for you, making it easy for the tenant, giving them an option, not taking more of my time, not making me responsible for a washer and dryer in the future. Happy tenant. 
if you have a smaller unit where, or you buy a property that doesn't have washer dryer hookups, I've looked at several, and if I bought one and it didn't have washer dryer, I would add it. I now don't want a washer dryer hookup set up. In that specific case, and Matt the Lumberjack Landlord does this too for smaller units where there's not a lot of space, I will use the new washer dryer combos. GE has some, I have a higher end one in my own unit to save space and because it's easier to install. The washer dryer combos that they have now can be large capacity. For a long time, they were like RV type, boat type, where they were 2.5 of whatever measurement they use. Now they're 4.6 or 4.3. So they they do just as large a laundry load as, as whatever. And if you have memory issues, I like the one unit set up because you put it in, you push a button, it washes, and then it dries. Waiting for that one to come out that folds it afterwards, but that doesn't happen yet. Here's the reasons why I like this. First, a one unit set for washer dryer takes up less space. That's not the best part. The best part is they run on 110. You don't even need a 220 hookup. So if you're adding this, all you really need is a wet one. It doesn't need a dryer vent. It vents through the drain where the water drains. So if you're doing an install in a small space where you don't want to add 220, that could be expensive to run, and you don't want to punch a hole through the wall for the dryer vent, the combination systems might cost a bit more, five or six hundred dollars for the ones that I've seen Matt using. I should get the price on one than one that he did. The higher end one that I'm using is 1500 or something, but it's connected to Wi-Fi and does everything that I want for the super lazy guy who travels all the time. Washers and dryers for me are a requirement. So my, my list of things that I want, right? I, I will, I'll generally list off, these are the things that I want that help me diversify my properties and limit my tenant turnover. So first I want my properties more than 10 miles apart, close to several economic drivers. Right, so I have many sources of tenants, like a base, port, college, hospital, Boeing, Amazon, large population. And then I want side-by-side -side units with, with washer dryer hookups in them, garages in the middle of prefer if possible, plenty of parking, fenced yards because it's pet friendly. So I can list all these things that make it good for tenant turnover. I'll purchase in a town like McKenna, Washington that has less than 500 population. But I don't want to buy a property that doesn't have a washer and dryer hookup. So it's more of a requirement to me than almost all of my other criteria. I could buy and add it if I wanted to, but I do want it to be there. If there's any type of appliance that I've missed in my rant to start out on appliances, which I know is super dry, not very entertaining information, but this is the tips that I think new landlords and new investors actually want. And that's why questions like Nicholas has come up. So the rest of this live stream, as long as my voice lasts, is going to be me answering all of the questions in the chat. So the idea with my live streams every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, thank you for joining me here if you're not in future land. What were the lottery ticket numbers? So my goal is to answer all of the questions, but I do want to talk for 10 to 15, maybe, what are we at? Doesn't say. 18 minutes, overshot the goal in the beginning to give people a chance to get questions into the comments because questions like Nicholas's will get content creators like me who have done what you're trying to do, reached financial freedom by investing in real estate or reaching financial freedom by living a frugal life to never live a frugal life again. The questions that you ask me tonight might be questions that other people don't even know they need to ask. If you have a rental, did you think of everything I brought up with the appliances? If you own rentals, can you point out the things that I missed? Because there are more things, more types of appliances that I didn't cover. If you have an Airbnb or a midterm rental, you probably have something like a Keurig machine or um, other conveniences that I don't do in my long-term rentals. CD cash flow is free. Howdy, totally agree. Great name. Howdy, love these live streams. Thank you, me too. Actually, the only way I know what day of the week it is, everyone think back to that week last week between Christmas and New Year's where you see all of the memes of what day is it, what planet am I on? I don't know if I have work. And if I do work, our vendors and customers aren't there. So it doesn't feel like a work day. Every day is like that for me. And Tuesdays, let me know. It's another week. This Tuesday, right? REI, <clears throat> REI Stoners, howdy. Good to see you. I was chatting with you earlier today. 
I had to put in a new stove range due to it being, how shall I say, put this a fire hazard second, the dishwasher due to being old and not working anymore, as well as missing track wheels saved the fridge. Awesome. Most of the places I purchased, the fridge was fine. Replaced within a few years. Um, and now I know when they were replaced, how long they should basically last, if I will replace them again or not. I'm trying to think. I've replaced a few stoves because they were fire hazards. I had a, a stove replaced and a 220 plug-in had to be worked on because old stoves, 220 could come from either side or 110 on each side and come together. Newer stoves, the oven or one part of the stove runs on 110 and then the electronics on the other on the top runs on 110 and it had to come from different sides. My, my house wasn't set up that way. And uh, the electrician had to fix that because I don't even really know how that stuff works. Happy to pay somebody that's learned the trade to, to fix those kind of things. Dividend day, howdy. Frank, howdy. Good to see you. Wealth building journey, good evening. Howdy. Wayne Wong, howdy. Northwest Coast, cheers. Cheers. Is it okay to drink after you just got over being sick? Duplex Dave. Greetings, mortals. Howdy. Ordered my new gaming laptop. Should be here in a couple days. I purchased at least a dozen sets of appliances. Know this topic well. I, 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 and then my light just decides to turn off. I love it. Why'd you do that? That's the haunted wheelchair downstairs, um, which we left when me and Millennium Mike broke into the basement. Maybe I should have moved it. <laughs> Um, Lumberjack Landlord did a tally one time on how many appliances he had. And I, I think I need to do that too one day just to see. Ninja Vanish, howdy, good to see you. Curtis, howdy, from Tacoma. I'm very sorry. Uh, Tacoma's fun. I don't want to own a rental inside Tacoma City Limits. Love these practical tips. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's the idea. It's not very exciting. Reaching financial freedom with buy and hold rentals. I say this every time I mention it in some form, like bigger pockets or choose FI or something. When somebody says, Well, how did you go from broke at 40 to retired at 52? I say, Well, the first question is, the first line is slow, boring, and not sexy. It takes a decade. It isn't going to happen in two years. It isn't going to be one or two decisions and then everything changes. It's just slow, consistent, buy cash flowing assets, increase them. Increase the rents over time. Mortgages don't. Watch rates to refinance to increase cash flow. I didn't touch equity. I've never done a HELOC. Cash out refinance or sold for 1031. None of the fancy stuff. No seller financing. No off-market deals. Slow and boring and not sexy. But the outcome, sorry for the unprofessional terminology, is freaking amazing. Jared, howdy. Good to see you. Howdy, howdy. Let's get this rowdy. There you go. All night or I'm here, but still roofing. Jared knows. Nice. They ask him if he's still here. There we go. Lena, that is funny timing. I agree. Janitor on fire took back a message to make me lose sleep and wonder forever and ever what was said that I missed. I appreciate that. Lena the header was on the Uneducated Economist channel, which people should check out. Jared. I'm guessing Dion is using a new mic. Is it a new mic or is my voice going? And if I put my phone down with lights up, I can turn the mic down. Here we go. Same mic, just way worse voice, I think. As long as it picked up the right mic. Yeah, it's the right mic. This, this sick voice. I don't have Phoebe's superpower. Michelle, howdy. Good to see you here. Financial fire up fighter. Aloha from Hawaii. Okay, howdy. Good to see you. Uh, Jared. Well, Anna, I'm going hands off back to roofing for the next hour or so. Thanks for hitting the like, everyone. Thank you. When I logged in, there was one like. There's 25 now. That is a really good ratio. Thank you for that. That was much appreciated, everybody. Buzz tune. Howdy. Good to see you. Uh, Frank, send a message to Duplex Dave. Would like to connect. Not sure if you received it. Anybody who wants to connect in the chat that isn't a moderator. Why is... Frank, not a moderator. Um, there you go. 
Now you guys can exchange emails in the chat, or you can email me at dion at deontalk.com and I will connect to people who want to connect from the chat. In case you don't want to put your email in a public chat, which I don't think is a smart thing to do. Jared, I will be in Washington at the Robin Hood Resort for the multifamily meetup. Looking forward to meeting Dion and all of you guys that are going. I know Millennial Mike will be there. I will be there. I think Lumberjack Landlord is 50-50. He's going to be there on Zoom, but he's participating. Uh, it should be a good time. Robin Hood Resort is a good place. Ben, howdy, Cynthia, howdy. Oh, look at that. Here you go. So I have a question, um, Cynthia. And this is for anybody else in the chat. People who've joined the binder strategy. So I do a free course on the binder strategy. If you want to know how to get your tenants to ask you to raise the rent, it's at deontalk.com. The binder course is there. Teaches you how to do it if you self-manage, have a property manager, section eight, military, working, doesn't matter. Teaches all the little nuances of that. So I put together a whole course for free. There's no like, you get half the information and then if you want the secret stuff, you got to pay. I mean, it's all there. You get my seller financing offer letter. You get my spreadsheet that I track my income and expenses with all in the binder strategy for free. So a lot of people have joined that. And then a lot of people have asked to join the Dion Talk Financial Freedom course chat. That chat is for the people who are in the course. So there are people like Frank and Cynthia you're in the course, Frank, right? So Cynthia has access too. So I need to figure out how to give her access because she requested it the other day. But if you're in the binder strategy and you're not in the course, it's not that I'm ignoring you. It's that is the chat for the course, which generally Tuesdays after the live streams, we're probably going to do this one or two nights this month. I, I talked to you guys in the last live stream. Tuesdays, I'm going to start doing members only and course lives kind of alternating after the live. Not today because the voice is gone. But starting next week, I should have my voice back. And so every Tuesday night after the live stream, if you're in the members course, if you're, in the, if you're a member or if you're in the course, we'll be doing that. Get on Zoom, hang out together, answer questions, look at deals if you're a member, portfolio deep dives and, and questions if you're in the course. Uh, so if you're in the binder course and you asked to join the other one, I'm sorry, I'm not ignoring you. It's just, that's the course chat. Robert, Angel, howdy. Do you also convert gas water heaters to electric? I don't know that I've ever had a gas water heater. I would, if it had an issue, I would then delete the gas and put in a water, electric water heater. Don't know that I would mess with it until it hit that. So here's with water heaters, not really an appliance, but I'll cover it in this video too, because there's, there's some nuances to this. At the beginning of 2022, I met with one of my handymen who is, is a plumber and has an electrician sub killer handyman to have. And I, and, and I said, okay, we're going to go through all the whole portfolio. It was seven properties at the time, but all the, you know, six, 16 units and a lot of different water heaters. And I said, I want to go through everything. If the water heater is over 12 years old, I want to replace it no matter what. If it's indoors, not if it's in the garage on cement, I'll go up to 12 years. But if it's inside in a closet, a pan with an expansion tank, eight years or older, older than eight years, I want to replace it. Had the conversation set up to do the review of the portfolio the rest of the year. And then in, while I was in Portugal, I had, it was either three water heaters and four refrigerators or four water heaters and three refrigerators. I forget. My spreadsheet and my book now. But they all decided to go out at the same time. Must have been a temperature shift or something that hit. If any of them were gas, and I don't have any that are, I, do, I only have two properties that have, have one property now that has gas. And if as, as issues pop up, which one is popping up, I might delete that system and put in cadet heaters or baseboard heat and then not have that issue going forward. But I wouldn't mess with a gas water heater until it hit its aged out point or it had an issue and needed to be replaced. Then I would delete the gas and put in electric. Mr. Banks, oh, of course not. Must have been answering one of my questions. I'm sorry, my memory doesn't go back that far. Um, Jared, 50 people here. Let's punch the like button for Dion. It might make him start feeling better and get over the crud. Entirely possible. I actually feel a lot better. It's just, now it's the voice. Duplex Dave, I always include a set of appliances in my rentals. 
Here's why most of my properties need work and, and by including the appliances as part of my make ready repairs, I get to add this to my depreciation. There you go. So I can expense 27.5 years. There you go. In addition to making the property more appealing and the ability to charge higher rent. Jared, I add washer and dryer and two fridges. I do co-living, so rent by room, and they need to provide everything. If you're renting by the room, I love the idea of two refrigerators. I wonder if that's something that um, Todd Baldwin does with his strategy. I know he's got shared living spaces that are cleaned by professionals. Um, Angel R, Dion, when you say 10 miles apart, do they need to be within 10 miles or 10 miles from each other? I want them 10 miles or more apart, I want them further away. I do have two properties that are a little less than seven miles apart. They're pretty close to each other. And I'm okay with that because they're central to a base, a port, a PLO, a university, it was Boeing. Like everything I list is in that same area. So those two I'm fine, but I've got one in McKenna, Washington. I don't want to own another in McKenna, Washington. The population's under 500. I've got one in Yelm, Washington. I don't want another one in Yelm because it was voted one of the top 50 worst towns to live in in the country. Um, it's my only single family house. It's actually on a lake, paid at boat access, and has a Section 8 tenant in it that rents just went up in January because of the Section 8 increase, which I talked to them before November to have the 60 day notice so that this month the rent increase would hit. So, yeah, Angel, I'm looking at them being further apart so that I'm pulling from different sources of tenants. Jason. Howdy. Yeah, I sent you a couple emails if you get a chance to take a look. Uh, I will have to take a look. I will look for them. Found a few in spam recently. So, Happy New Year, John. Same to you. You, Jared, Dion. Your hand gestures may be causing the Zoom to do fireworks. If you make a heart symbol with two hands, I think the heart shows up on the heart screen. So it does the, you usually get the thumb up. If you put your hand out here somewhere, we'll pick it, pick it up. It's Google AI. Most people see the heart symbol like this. Since I've been friend zone so many times, I seem to see it like that. But dividend Dave. <laughs> howdy again. JMC, howdy. Keith, howdy. Robert, I need some help. I can't shut up and wait because I feel like my financial freedom will be somewhat ruined if I am not in perfect shape. Have any ideas to shift my mindset about this? No plan survives the first punch to the face, right? So if you want to get in perfect shape, have the perfect strategy, find the perfect deal, something's going to go wrong and it'll stop you every time. Take the Marine Corps adage of get to 80% and take action. If you're at 80% certainty, you can move when the situation changes as you start to take action. And it isn't hurry up and buy. There's really two types of goals. I almost made this video with the three amigos this morning, um, but my memory kicked in. Um, which it's going to do again. What is this about goals? You have outcome goals and performance goals. Outcome is something like, I want to buy a rental in 2024. You can't control an outcome. That's a goal. You set a goal. You might want to have a rental by 2024. But a performance goal is, I want to make sure that I spend at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week, if not more, looking at deals. That's performance. You can control what you do with your time. You can't control the outcome. The outcome is I want a rental. Performance is I want to do this. So Robert, look at the, the logic of doesn't it make sense to. So remember, you, you're quoting the book, Shut Up and Wait, right? Which I did Christmas version of, so I could tell people to shut up without being offensive. If you learn how to say, If you learn how to save, which means increase your income, overtime, side hustle, learn a skill to be more attractive to your employer, get a promotion, change companies for a raise, whatever it is to make more money, that's more effective than reducing costs. So how do you make more money? And then how do you control your costs? What can you eliminate? How, how can you determine between a need and a want? What delayed gratification can impact you? Once you learn how to save, and you realize you, you kind of do now have an, an amount every month you can add to your savings, right? Kind of makes sense to go work on your credit score, right? So logic says go to the next step. 
once you have your credit score to a point where you might have good lending options, it kind of makes sense to then go talk to a lender. Have you done that, Robert? Have you so have you learned how to save, worked on your credit score? Have you gone to talk to a lender to find out what your options are? What do you qualify for? What things in your credit might be having a hard impact against you? What are your limitations? Um, is house hacking an option? Is it buying an investment property an option? Do you have equity? Do, do you have uh, a debt to income ratio that works? All of the things that a lender is going to look at, once you do that, kind of makes sense then to go pick a market because now you know what your limits are and you've got the credit score working on and you're saving. All of this can be happening over the next couple of years or the last couple of years, whatever you've been doing this, whenever you started to focus on this. Once you focus on a market, kind of makes sense to pick an asset class, right? You, like the logic sends you to the next step. Once you picked an asset class and you've studied in the market and you've learned average and you realize you can find deals that beat average, makes sense to talk to an agent and get those searches set up. And so you've looked on Redfin and Zillow and you kind of have an idea what's out there, but now you want MLS searches set up. So you talk to several agents to get that going. Once you start looking at deals, there are people who make a 50 tab spreadsheet and have all of the data and start making offers like the, the, the over, over analyzing analysis paralysis kicks in, but you surround yourself with people that hang out like the members only groups or in the course Zooms and we all talk to each other and, and you hear other people making offers that sound, no kidding, no kidding. The person who overanalyzes has so much data is sitting there looking at deals and then here's somebody else saying, well, I made an offer, I hope they take it. And the perception is that person hasn't studied the market half as long isn't half as confident in their abilities, but is making offers because it's the right step for them. Then the overanalyzing person started to make offers. One of them didn't work out. One of them didn't have good parking. Whatever the thing is that that made it go, go to the next thing to keep making offers, who are you surrounded by? What are they doing? Right. I made the video that I had to take down and I'll be making another one and not naming anybody by names so I don't get sued. Um, where my friend lost $100,000 because the crash bros told him don't buy and our friends that reached financial freedom and retired with rentals told him don't buy because forbearance is going to end, everyone's going to go into foreclosure and there's going to be a flood for the market. And I bought a duplex right across the street from one that was for sale that I was trying to get my friend to buy and he didn't buy. So he lost $100,000, I made $100,000. If I was surrounded only by my friends who were afraid and not buying... Would I have bought? Would I have taken action even though I had reached financial freedom? Or do I hang out with Millennial Mike, who's doing some awesome creative strategies on investing at a distance with, with moving money in ways that I'm too lazy to even learn, right? And Lumberjack Landlord, who's doing his own, managing his own rehabs and burrs and growing a hundred plus rental portfolio, buying a jail, and then talking with Zuber every week, every Tuesday with the three amigos to do videos. Since I hang out with people taking action, logically it makes sense for me to take action. So let your let your competence at each step give you the confidence to move to each phase and audit your network. Hopefully Robert, that helps. Ethan, howdy. Bought my first rental and currently looking for a tenant. The house came with a fridge that was ice water on the door. Should I replace it with fridge that doesn't have this before I place a tenant? Good question. I generally don't like to have that, but I'm in class C properties, right? I'm not in super fancy. I'm in working class. Um, what is normal for your area? There are like Lumberjack Landlord has some really high-end places where he puts in I would, if I owned that, I would probably put in a fridge that has water and ice maker and all of that too. Is it normal for the rental that you have? Do similar rentals have, what type of fridge do similar rentals in your area have? Consider that too. Because so, there is no one right way, right? What What is normal for your area? What is the age of the fridge? Maybe if you go to replace it, if, if it's borderline right now and it looks like it's at the end of its, its days and it's probably going to be replaced within the next two to three years, I'd probably replace it now and delete that. If it's two years old or less, three years old or less, and probably has another 10 years in it, why mess with it? I would order some filters, have them on hand uh, for the tenants. Um, a couple of extra things that can break. Those are refrigerators that generally, if, if they, something breaks, you have it repaired. Um, since I don't do the water 
uh, and ice making fridges. I'll generally replace them without having to work on them. So there's a couple elements that, to look at there. If you want to email me, Ethan, like some details on that fridge, I might be able to give you a clearer answer. Then my email's in the chat for everybody else who wants to connect with each other or ask questions you don't want to ask in a public format. Dave and Dave, can you get a financial firefighter to stop making fun of me? Stop giving him ammunition, Dave. JMC, financial freedom equals all the nothing you can do while the SWAN account grows. Exactly. There never is enough time to do all of the nothing that you want, and the sleep well at night account is very important. JMC, how can we become members to be a part of those live streams? Does it cost to become a member? Also, what's the cost to join the course? So the course is at deontalk.com. The Binder Strategy course is free. And I want to try to keep it free forever. The, the, the to have the site up, uh, it was ten grand to put the courses together. Um, it cost me like four or five hundred dollars a month, and now I'm finding there's annual renewal on some things. So the total aggregated cost to maintain that website and that is about fourteen hundred bucks a month to have the courses there. So as long as I can, the binder course will be free. I'm not sure if when the course signups don't at least pay for the website, if I shut it all down, or if I have to charge for the binder, right? That, that's way in the future. Um, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to charge for the binder. It helps tenants and it helps landlords. Like it helps both sides of the equation. So I want that to be free as long as possible. The course is normally $7.95. Uh, right now there's a hundred dollar off promo going on where it's $6.95. So there is a cost to the course. And that's lifetime membership. As long as, long as the course is up, you have access. It's not like you have to renew every year or anything. It's just you're in the course. So every time we do course live videos, you have access to them when they're downloaded and put up on the, the uh, Mighty Network site. And uh, you can join all of those course every every time we do. Generally, what I do is I pick a month and I do every week for that month. Then I'll take a month off. But we'll see. January, I think I'm going to do a mix of it. The, to be a member, significantly less. There is a cost. It's here on YouTube. Sometimes you can't see it on your device because there's not a join button. So if you're, I don't know if it's Android or Apple, but one of them doesn't have to show the join button. You have to actually log in on a computer or a laptop to YouTube and there's a little join. It's like $2.99, like $2.99 a month, not $2.99 or $4.99 a month. There's no difference. It's just some people want to support the channel more and some people want to save money. I totally get it either way. But the members ones only happen generally two times a month. And we get on Zoom and we look at deals. And the reason I had to do it members, it's not because I was trying to make $3 a person to be in there, right? It's because if I did those videos, I think it would kill my channel if I did it on regular YouTube because they're super boring, right? Kind of like this video. This video is on appliances. Who do you think opened up YouTube today? There are some people who opened it and said, oh, there's appliances. I'm looking for that because I have this thing with my rental right now. So 10 views on this will come from people that logged in to look at it. But mostly YouTube is people that go and they have, I have 20 minutes or I have an hour to kill or I have a commute. I'm going to listen to something on YouTube. They scroll until they find something, right? Appliances probably isn't going to get that many views. But the people who come and they ask the question, I wanted the title, the thumbnail to be, this is me answering that specific question. So if I did a bunch of those, I think the channel would die. It would shrink. Like we're literally, I think tonight, possibly crossing the 15,000 threshold on subscribers. What is that right now? 14... Nine nine six. So we're four people away from fifteen thousand subscribers. So we're probably going to cross that in the next at least six months. And the members only. What we do is we can do mine, but I prefer that we do somebody's that's in the, the group, right? So they can actually get a deep dive look at one of their properties. We open the email from the agent. We literally go to the search for the homes. Then we go through stream of consciousness. What would I look at on this property? What order do I look at them in? What things do I care about? Do I look at the neighborhood? Do I look at, is it an HOA? Do I look at the layout of the streets around it? Do I look for flood zone? Like, good, go through everything. And we do the math. Like most people with real estate focus on what's my return? What's my cash on cash return? I'm like, yeah, that's one of 20 factors that make a deal good or bad. Are there physical aspects of the property that'll help limit tenant turnover? What's the parking like? Especially if you're small multifamily, you're going to rent by the room. That could be a deal killer. And so we go through all of that. Imagine if you opened YouTube and you're like, oh, I have 20 minutes to kill. Let me look at this. And it's people looking at an email and then looking at a rental. 
right? So you generally what works best here is a 10 to 15 minute. Let me teach you three things about real estate. Three things you can remember that'll help you make you a better real estate investor, right? That, that's the YouTube stuff that gets watched the most. So if you want to join that and it and it, it comes up on a video just like this. So if you want, you can sit back and just be an observer, hang out in the chat. Or the first comment I do is the Zoom link so that we can all join Zoom together and hang out and ask questions. Um, we have to be professional and YouTube pretty until the end of the live stream. And then we close that down and it's just hanging out on Zoom. And we say, well, things that can get us sued. Oculus. Howdy. What's the advantage of replacing gas water heater with a lot? I don't want gas in any of my structures. It's know your local um, normalcies. Help me out. There's a word that probably means it better than that. What is normal in your area? If you're on the East Coast, gas seems the cheapest way to go and very natural. That was punny just for you, Dave. Loverjack Landlord has gas in most of his things, manages it in Washington. Everything that is gas is metal and rusts and has issues, um, has more ways, more maintenance problems. In every movie I've ever seen, I've never seen an electric stove explode because the burner was left on. But that happens in every movie with gas, right? So I just, it doesn't get me anymore. I don't have enough people that are really into cooking that say, oh, I paid $500 more a month rent if you had a gas stove here. I like consistency. I know exactly what a water heater costs. I know exactly what installing it takes. I know that a electric stove plugged in is going to cost me three to five hundred dollars, free delivery, free haul away, versus a gas stove um, that can have all kinds of gas line problems. So the place that I just purchased this last year now, since the new year, um, I don't know if you know that's how time works. Had gas. They, they had gas and I deleted it all, just ripped it all out, put in cadet heaters. Um, I actually showed the people and I think it was the members of the course that the cadet heater that I put in here because I'm putting in a wall in this room. So there's literally a two by four with a cadet heater mounted where the wall is going to be. Um, electricity works the best here. And then, then I've had people say, well, I want gas in case the power goes out. Gas heat does not work if the power is out. Uh, Oculus, I have my chat moved. <clears throat> I have a water heater needing repair near end of life, so going to replace it. Any tips from the group? So the group might have answers. You can replace it with gas if it's your thing. If it's normal for your area, what is normal? Um, for me, I've uh, I would replace it with electric, but that's just me. Mr. Banks, howdy. Do you have the water heater flushed every year or do you flush them yourself? There are people that have told me my septic system has to be, I don't know, drained every three years or something. The septic system that I just replaced, the last time it was touched was 1991. Touched, period. Um, I think I've drained a septic system, a different one, using somebody from the chat here that is, 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 owns his own septic system some company around here um once different different system uh flush the water heater is that a thing when where, when when was that ever a thing i've never done it um and those ones that i replaced that were out were close to 20 years in their age Right. So I was just getting to the point where I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to be a grown up and be proactive and cycle through my water heaters. Flushing them might have made them last longer, but they would have been way past the, the point of what I would have replaced them due to age anyway. So the answer, Mr. Banks, is I have never flushed a water heater in a rental or where I've lived, no matter the age of it. Maybe that's normal for where some people are at. In Washington, I don't know that that's even a thing. And then Dividend Dave took back a message to also make me lose sleep. But I'm pretty sure it was something snarky. Angel Art, I appreciate you too. Thank you. Dividend Dave, if there's a 51% chance of success taken. That used to be the marriage statistic. Now it's like 31% chance of success. And remember, boys and girls, in a successful marriage, 
ends in death. Jared took back another message. Oculus just bought the place this year, but didn't know about flushing the water heater until recent research. Yep. D, uh, Jared, Dean, are you doing a member Zoom this weekend? So Jared, for the month of January, that's what we're in, right? Yeah. Uh, it's going to be Tuesday nights after the live stream. So not this week. We're probably going to do a members next week, then a course the next week, then a members the next week, then a course the next week. So that's what I'm going to do for January. Usually the same night, because this is when it seems like the most people can make it. Weekends is hard because half the people want Saturday, half the people want Sunday. So currently for this month, Tuesday nights. Not doing tonight because my voice, I'm surprised it's made it this long. Cheers. Remember, Alien Vodka doesn't actually sponsor my videos. They just make the videos possible. Words are hard. Robert, more context on my question. I just closed on a duplex number three, so I made it that far in the uh, fire journey. Just worried that what I can't do something like hike the entire App Appalachian Trail by the time I hit financial freedom. Hit fire. Yeah. So you've hit number three. We talk often, the, the three amigos, the REI Avengers, like all of us, Zuber, Millennial Mike, Matt, on the first five years kind of suck. It's not that. So my chronology, at two years, I buy a duplex. At four years, I buy a duplex. At 5.5 years, I buy a duplex. You would think, okay, so... At five and a half years, the cash flow starts to be a lot because you have a duplex, a duplex, and a duplex. And that's not why the cash flow became good. It's because at five years, I had the first duplex for three and a half years. I had the second duplex for a year and a half. So stabilization has happened. Rent increases because the binder strategy has happened. Uh, that's where the income snowball comes in. So you have three. Three is when you might start to see cash flow from each unit, right? But how long have you had the first one? How long did you have the second one? Has stabilization happened on them? Has it happened on all three? And stabilization is the existing leases ran out. You had the time to do the binder strategy. You had the months that go by. So you can give notice of the, you know, you have to give notice of the rent increase, even if the tenant asks for it. And then the next year, because most of my properties got somewhere around a 10% cash on cash return the first year. I had some 12s and I had 117. All of them are over 20% by year three. So the first one is now at a 20% IRR. That went, that's like 40 or 50% IRR. It, it cash on cash return was over 20%. The second one was getting close. And then I had acquired the third one. That income snowball isn't just because of the number of assets, but some of it is the duration that you've had the first, second, and maybe third asset as the time goes by after that fifth year. First, first five years are going to suck. Frank and Cynthia bought several properties in, in this last year. And yeah, stabilization happened. Some tenant turnover happened. Talk, property management shifting happened. This year, cash flow compared to next year is going to be night and day. And then this is 2024. So 2027, when they've had those properties for three years, three and a half years, they're not even going to be able to compare. They're going to be like, yeah, wh wh why is it now producing $1,000 a month in profit when we bought it, it made two thirty. dollars it's, it's not like the rent has gone up that much. No, it's other things that have happened. Possibly rates have come down in the next three years and a refinance happened. Possibly you found that room that was a den or a family room where you can add a simple wall or a door or a light switch or a closet. And all of a sudden it's a three bedroom instead of a two bedroom. Like all of the things that can happen in those next three years, Robert, that can happen to your properties is why yeah, it might not feel like you're always taking action, but all the time that's passing is having a compounding effect. Keith. Too much drama and time when you come between a divorced ex-couple to buy home from them. It's a long and costly sticky wicket. Very true. I would, I would agree with that. MC, howdy. If refrigerator quits cooling, do you pay any food loss? If not, do you put that on the lease agreement? I, I've had that once. And I offered to deduct food that they could buy in the next day off the rent. Tenants declined. Uh, so it depends on your relationship with your tenants. 
you can put it in the lease that the tenants are required to have renter's insurance. That's what you would normally do in that situation. My leases all require tenants are supposed to have renter's insurance. I don't care that they do. I don't check. It gives me an out on this. But if I have a refrigerator that goes out and it's really old and I kind of knew that it was going and I probably should have replaced it, yeah, I'm going to pay for the food um, within reason. Again, working class, class C neighborhood, food's going to be maybe a couple hundred bucks. Uh, expenses do not impact cash flow. So if, if there's anybody here who's new to my channel, make sure you understand very clearly what I'm about to teach in this next deal and talk segment. If your property makes $200 a month, so you make $2,400 a year in profit, 200 a month times 12, 2,400. And you have a thousand dollar expense. A new investor or an investor who doesn't run the math the way that I teach would say, I was going to make $2,400, but I had a thousand dollar expense. So I'm only going to make $1,200. That's like the simple math. You would have made $2,400. That's not the math. And you take off a thousand. So they're going to make $1,400. Like they lost a thousand dollars in profit. They correct this. Expenses do not impact cash flow. Because when we run the numbers on a rental, it is annual profit divided by cost to acquire. When we figure out our annual profit, that is all of the income, rent, pet fees, parking, storage, laundry, whatever your sources of income that you have are there, minus expenses, principal, interest, taxes, insurance, HOA, um, utilities, if you have any, like the, the property management, if you have those expenses, and we set aside a, a percentage of gross rents for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. I chose 15%. I self-manage, so I don't have to set aside for property management, but 10% for repairs and maintenance and 5% for vacancy means 15% of gross rent. So if my rent is $2,000 a month, I'm setting aside 15% or $300 a month every single month so that in a year, I have $2,400 in profit, $3,600 went into an account so that when I have $1,000 of expenses, my $1,000 comes out of that money set aside for future repairs and vacancy to pay for that expense. My cash flow is not touched and not even all of the $3,600 was touched. So if you have to replace the food, the tenants paid you for that. The part of the rents, the gross percentage, it, the percentage of gross rents that you set aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy pays for the food. I'm okay with that. doesn't impact me at all. Tenants paid for it. And $200 to me when it's part of the tenant's rents that's been set aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy is a lot less impact on me than $200 to a tenant who often needs all four weeks to save up the money for the next month's rent. JMC. I was doing the work and doing the spreadsheet by box. Is the data of each property in the spreadsheet a guesstimated analysis? Example, some variables are dependent on county or property value. So I've never used a spreadsheet. I might make a list, handwritten list of properties that I'm watching to remind myself to go back and look to see if they're still on the market, if it hits a certain days on market to make an offer. Um, I think if you're doing the spreadsheet to buy box, you are in that over analyze uh, personality type who could easily fall down the rabbit hole. Michael Zuber says this about himself, right? He, he works in tech. He spent six months in the spreadsheet that cost him six months. Yes, math is important. But does the spreadsheet talk about parking, physical aspects of the property that help limit tenant turnover, type of neighborhood, right? All of the things that you're, you're going to want to run on a property, these all take, and it's funny when we do the um, members only live stream where we look at deals, we did one with uh, a couple, three weeks ago, maybe now, we deep dive look, it took 40 minutes. Right. We, we really looked at this property. We found a, a water plant across the street. We wanted to make sure it was a water plant, not a desalination plant or a septic or, you know, city sewer problem. So it can have a smell or whatever. It's just like, look, looked at the Averton area. We did look at the map. 40 minutes to have the conversation of what do we look at? How do we consider? What are all of the things that we're going to be uh, looking at versus the minute and a half 
maybe five minutes as he went deeper and deeper and deeper and looking into that property to make the offer. All of the things that it takes to teach and understand how to look at a rental takes this much time. Doing the work is minutes, seconds, and sometimes you can eliminate in seconds. It's when it's a good looking property that you start, you can, it takes time to hunt for all the red flags, right? So, It's a guesstimated analysis, it is, and math is only one step, right? We're looking at, are there washer-dryer hookups? What's the parking? Is there a garage? Is the garage normal for your area? Is it fenced? Is it pet-friendly, right? All of those things aren't going to fit into a spreadsheet. And so basically, it's learning the skill that takes time. And this is why I try to explain this. Owning real estate and being financially free with rentals is a very passive. I have total right now 18 rental units i live in one and one is being rehabbed so i have 16 rentals takes me less than two hours a month to, ma to manage them completely less than two hours some months will take four hours but the average is most months take me 30 minutes because all i'm really doing is making sure the rent is there maybe looking at a text and then the months that take four or five hours balances out to our all year it's about two hours a month property manager would cost me over thirty thousand dollars for those two hours a month I'll do that work myself. That sounds passive. I'm making 30,000 more on my portfolio because I can self-manage. Then I would have had a property manager. Acquiring rentals is not passive. Like learning the skills to manage isn't passive. Learning the skill to hunt for the deal, hunting for the deal, making the offers, negotiating, all of that takes a bunch of time. It's once you get them in place that it becomes passive. It is a guesstimate. You want to make sure that you're interacting with a lot of other investors. You have them looking at your deals. You're looking at their deals. The best way to learn if your math is accurate on a rental, behind the curtain view here, reach out to an investor that has several rentals and ask them, hey, let me run the numbers on your rental and tell me how close I got. It's a known. They know what they're making. Do that several times and then you learn the skill. Once you have the skill, then you take it out and use it. It's harder to learn the skill on the deals you're trying to make offers on because if you mess up, you can mess up, right? It can cost you money if you mess up. So the person who sweats more in practice bleeds less in battle. Find the known, practice it yourself, see how close you get. Do it with a couple of different investors. You might not have to ask them for their exact details, but you know, how close am I? I think you're making this much money on that property. Here's what I consider to see if I missed anything. Most investors are happy to do that because most people are in the same position I'm in. If they're an investor and they have several rentals and they're either on the path to financial freedom or they've reached financial freedom. We can't talk about this crap with our friends and family because it's an argument and a disagreement. My brother who reached financial freedom with 10 paid off rentals, called me a moron because I was buying rentals with mortgages. Until I reached financial freedom. Then he said, oh, you might be onto something here. How do you do that? Ethan, thanks. Uh, we go. I'll send you an email. Already enjoy your channel. You're partly to blame for me buying this rental. Partly to blame. I will take the credit either way. Michelle Meyer. Dave and Mark, you should do a live where you make fun of each other. They should absolutely do that. Oculus. I think you started with a basic lease and modified over time. What are some of the clauses you've added over time? No water beds. What other clauses have I added? I added an addendum for a while that's now just part of the lease on plumbing issues if it's caused by roots or a break of the pipe or the landlord's problem but if it's caused by the stuffed animal hygiene products down the pipe it's the tenant's responsibility to pay for those um, the thing i recommend oculus with your lease and i actually recommended this with rei stoners who's doing this and i got this from my brother the one who called me more we love each other well, i love him i can't put words in his mouth but take the lease to an attorney 
who works in the county where you invest, the person who's probably going to be the one that you would retain or use during an eviction, and ask the attorney specifically, is there anything that we can add to my lease that makes your job easier if we ever go through an eviction together? Because they work in that court system. They're an officer of the court. They know what works there. They know what doesn't fly. They know what seems predatory. They know what seems um, frivolous. And they'll know how to word it in a way. And there was some things that my attorney added to mine that I don't remember. But it wouldn't help you unless you're investing in Pierce and Thurston counties in Washington state, right? Because that's where that clauses would help. But that's what I would do. Make sure an attorney that that works there where you are, that knows the laws where you invest, uh, can look at it. Laura, howdy, good to see you. Just wanted to say hi and wish everyone a great new year, great topic. Can't wait to watch it in future times on family vacation right now. Awesome, hope it's a trip full of amazing. Robert, call what I'm going through a willpower fatigue. For reference, in New Hampshire, an electric water heater costs $1,000 a year to run versus 250 a year run saves the tenant $66 a month. Do the tenants know? My tenants don't know, don't care what the cost differences are. Might be an East Coast thing because uh, if you're anywhere near Matt and it's Siberia and it's a huge thing. That's why I think gas is the cheapest way to go and it can save you money. In Washington, gas would cost us way more than our electric does here. So Robert, yeah, gas makes sense there. Totally agree. Frank Contreras, 2.3 years and counting. It does start to have an impact. Oculus, I'm testing baseline. Might be related to Hemlane, but not sure. They let you create virtual named accounts, like one for expenses, one for security deposits, et cetera. Nice. I am not familiar with baseline, but hopefully it works out for you. I think I'm going to give it another minute, but I think we're running out of questions. Or my nasally voice from getting over my cold has irritated people and they've left and there's no questions left. JMC, when you purchase the property, do you put the payment on a credit card? Doesn't that huge debt amount ruin your credit score? So I've never purchased and put any payment on credit card. No. I think there are some gurus out there that say you can use a credit card to buy an 18 unit like Robert Kiyosaki says says that back in the day that might have been a thing. Um I am slow, boring, not sexy. I'm not trying to make anything go faster. I save up a down payment. Yeah, in the beginning I was only making $17 an hour. I found out about $89,000 in bad debt in my name I didn't know existed till the divorce. I had three kids, got laid off from law enforcement. Not a good position. So I saved for two years to house hack a duplex, right? House hacking isn't required. If you make more money, you can save the down payment easier. I was struggling to even save the down payment for the duplex at a 5% down owner occupied, nothing on a credit card. The only way that I use credit cards to get cash back isn't the purchase of the property. Like I've never done that. What I do is I structure the mortgage payment. We call it principal interest taxes and insurance, right? My lenders pay the principal, I pay them the principal, I pay them the interest, they pay the taxes. Taxes are escrowed with my mortgage. I pay the insurance with a credit card for the cash back. So that's what I'm using my credit card for as far as rentals go. Um, when you go to do the down payment on a house, a lot of lenders would have a problem with it being a credit card because they have to know that the money is seasoned. It's in your account. It's been there for several months. If it hasn't, they need to know the source. So it can't be a loan from your parents usually because that's a loan. So what you'll see is people commit fraud and they'll say, my parents gifted me $40,000 for the down payment for this place, but they're actually paying their parents back, which means their debt to income ratio is worse than what the lender thinks it is, which is what makes it fraud. But it's very common. I'm not saying do that. I'm saying I've heard people do that. I would never do that. First of all, I have uh, my inheritances from my parents. I showed them in a live not too long ago or in this room with me. The only things I got from my parents, a 44 Ruger Blackhawk from my mom who weighed 97 pounds when she was soaking wet and a Ruger, a Ruger, Remington 12 gauge shotgun from my dad. It's my inheritance. 
So no gift from them to buy anything. I don't know that I would use a credit card to buy it because your lender is going to ask you, where did the down payment come from? You have to show bank statements, months of them. And if you're using a credit card, that does impact your debt to income ratio. So is it possible to do that? If your debt to income ratio is good enough? Sure. If you find a lender who's okay with it? Sure. Haven't used the strategy myself. I do hear people that are trying to sell that real estate is it? Have you heard me? Have you ever heard me on my channel say real estate investing is easy? I will say... It's not easy, but you can make it easier, right? Because it's really hard and things we can do to make it easier is if you buy places that don't have high tenant turnover, you're not placing tenants very often, you're not doing rehabs very often. That's easier than having high tenant turnover. But is it easy? No. Is it simple? Yes. Simple doesn't mean easy. It takes dedication. It takes patience. The thing that most of us don't have, especially when you're lazy, it's like, I don't want to work, but I don't want to work now. I had to work for a decade to have to never work again. So good question, DMC. Uh, it's, a it's a strategy that's out there that is possible to use, not one I recommend. Keith, smash the like button on your way out and turn off the lights. That would be the light turns off on its own sometimes. It's really weird. Jared, I use my credit card to pay for construction for the air miles. I pay it off almost immediately. So Jared, great point and a good chance to make a Dion talk. It's saying there's an ad coming down. I skip it. Skip that. Hey, look at that. No ad. All right. Um, anybody who's ever watched an ad, thank you for the penny. I pay my credit card off every day. Not once a week, not once a month. I wish I had the the foot that I took a screenshot of it, I have it saved. So I'm going to find it, put it in a video one day. I had a balance of like $238 on my credit card. And that took 24 points off my credit score because they can check on different days. And based on the card activity that day, they can lower your credit score. People are worried about a hard inquiry, taking six points off your credit score that goes away in two months. So first, I don't have the best memory. So I pay it off every day so I can never forget and have a late payment or pay interest or carry a balance from one month to the next. Second is that um, my credit score hovers. I, like here, I'll open. I haven't looked at it in a while, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open Credit Karma. It's going to use facial recognition. So let me turn on, close that. Where are we at? So I don't, I don't have an 850. I'm an 8 something. So I don't teach people how to do credit. But it's around there for a few reasons. One, I automate everything. Second, I pay off credit cards the day of. I make an expense. I go out, I go out and have a, a meal. I pay it off right after it's done to help keep the credit score higher. Uh, so, yeah. And, and I do use, I do, um, there are people who say, Dave Ramsey says, don't use a credit card. And if you don't have the discipline to not carry a balance, like the average balance in the U.S. is like 16000 carried for two years. That's not good. But mine is zero, never carried a balance, never ever carried credit card debt until I found out about the 89 grand that I didn't know about until the divorce. And I was like, wow, that's what that feels like. Good times. Uh, it was actually $313,000 that I negotiated down to 89. I made a video on that too. Um, but I used my credit card for cash back. My cash back this last week was like $238 for the month before. Because I bought several things for rentals. I, I don't have an LLC. I have a long list of reasons why I don't have an LLC. Um, none of my properties are in or ever will be in an LLC. There are times when it makes sense. But mine, I don't like LLCs. I've done that rent several times. Uh, so we don't, unless you want to hear it, we don't need to go over that again today. Um, so I, credit cards, I have one checking account, one saving account, one credit card used for cash back. And I get a lot of cash back from it because all my business runs through the same credit card. Good old times. Howdy. With properties that do not have separate water and sewer, do you pay it in your name and have the tenant reimburse you for their water usage? If yes, how would you split the bill? The new year. Oh, so that's the next one. Thanks, Steve. Just a sec. Um, so I have properties there where the, the water and sewer aren't separate. And the city of Tacoma requires that it be in the owner's name on one property, but not another. I understand it. So I pay the water and the sewer. What I did, and you have to know your local laws to make sure this is legal, because in some areas you are not allowed to charge a penny more than the actual cost of the utilities. So I 
ask your utility company what is what is the average utility cost right for the last couple of years they usually provide you with that data and so in mine it was like 47 dollars a month for for unit right and, and so what i did is i charged 55 dollars a month it's legal in my area so that in the summer when i have those months where it's 80 or 90 dollars for the water for that one or two months where the water spikes it balances out the rest of the year so it's even because i'm not trying to be reimbursed perfectly i just want to make sure i'm not out of pocket much if i am because i have good enough rents to make money you can also do a strategy that other people use where the tenant pays the water and sewer bill a month in the rears so when you get the bill you forward that in an email to the tenant and you say, here's your responsibility for the current water and sewer bill. Put it in your lease that that's how it's done. Make sure whatever you're doing is legal in your area. I would also go on Zillow, Apartments.com, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, and look at rentals and see what other landlords are doing, what seems to be the most common way to handle utilities. That might be the model you use because you're competing against them. That's a good question. I like it. Hopefully that helped. Stephen, Happy New Year. Is the house hack on FHA loan requirements one or two years to be used as primary residence? So first, Stephen, um, like an LLC, there are times, <clears throat> there goes the voice, there are times it makes sense to have an LLC. There are times, it's rare, but there are times having an FHA loan makes sense. FHA is not meant for first-time home buyers. It was not created to help people get on the ladder of property, the property ladder. It was not help, created to help people become first-time home buyers. A lot of people assume a house hack or a first-time buyer should use FHA because it has an F and H in it. They think first-time home buyer, and that's not it's federal housing authority. It's designed to shorten recessions. It's a very bad loan product. The idea was in 1934, over 2 million people in the construction industry were laid off and the federal government came out and said, hey, we're going to create the Federal Housing Authority. And we're going to issue loans. We're going to back loans for people to build their houses. If you have bad credit, bad debt to income ratio, we'll still help you get a property so we can get these 2 million people back to work and we don't have riots. That's the FHA loan in a nutshell, right? Edited with my own flavor, but that's it. That's the timeline, 1934. And the spike in FHA goes up in every recession. Uh, usually by 7% increase every time we've had a recession because it's the most used because people get worse credit and worse debt to income ratio. So they're using FHA. But here's the problem. FHA means 3.5% down. Sounds good. If you're buying a house or a house with an ADU and you haven't owned a house for the last three years, a conventional loan is only 3% down. Three is better than 3.5. A conventional loan is easier to get accepted by the sellers because it doesn't have the hoops that the FHA has to jump through. Whether they're real or not, the seller's perception is often FHA is more restricted. So it's easier to get your offer accepted. You can do less down than 3.5%. If it's owner-occupied, to answer your question, FHA or conventional has a one-year intend-to-occupy requirement. And there aren't police that go around and look at where you live. Really what it is is a time delay device. For 12 months, you can't get another owner-occupied loan. That's the reality of it. I'm not saying commit fraud. Because while prison is the ultimate house hack, it's not my chosen, chosen form of retirement. Don't commit fraud. Conventional and FHA, if you put less than 20% down, <clears throat> has a mortgage insurance. Well, PMI versus MIP. So there's different nuances to it, but there's an added cost every month because you don't have 20% down. With conventional loan, as soon as you, if you, if you do 20% down, there's no mortgage insurance. If you do less than 20% down, you have mortgage insurance until your equity hits 22%. As soon as it hits 22%, automatically, your mortgage insurance goes away without having to refinance. They say automatically because I would still reach out to your lender and make sure it happens when you get close to that. With mortgage insurance on FHA, it exists for the length of the loan. Until death do us part. You either have to pay off the mortgage, refinance, or sell the property to get rid of that mortgage insurance. So it's harder to get it accepted. It's more down than conventional. It, it, if you have really bad credit and a really bad debt to income ratio, FHA is better than not buying a house at all. Right? So it's an option. But it's not the best for house hacking. The house with an ADU uses single family lending. Here's where FHA was better for a while. 
conventional will do 5% down on your second house. So you buy a house and then let's say in a year you want to move and buy another house hack. Conventional will let you do that. And But now you can't do 3% down because you've owned a house in the last three years. You're going to do 5% down for a house or a house with an ADU. If you have an FHA and you buy a house, let's say next year you want to buy another house and a house hack again, you can't with another FHA loan because you only have one at a time. You can have up to 10 conventional loans in your name. You can actually have unlimited conventional loans in your own name if they're house hacks. So when you get 10 conventional loans in your name and you go to buy another property, you can use conventional as long as you're going to own or occupy. So if you're using FHA, they also have a regulation that it is not intended to create investors. Right? The, the purpose of FHA loans is to shorten the duration of recessions. So you're not supposed to be able to buy investments. So if you own a house and you want to buy a fourplex, FHA lenders are going to say, why? You have to justify why. You can say, it's closer to work. It's a better school district. There's three bedrooms in each unit. And the one I'm in now only has two, so it's bigger. Like You can try to justify it. They can say no for whatever reason they want. On the conventional side, they don't have that requirement. You don't have to be moving towards a single family, so four, three, two, one, or from a single family to a bigger or nicer single family. You can just buy the next one. I went from a duplex to a fourplex. No questions asked, conventional loan. <clears throat> Here's where FHA shined up until November 18th, 2023. If you wanted to buy a triplex or a fourplex, a conventional lender often wanted 15, 20, 25, maybe even 30% down, right? The conventional restrictions for owner-occupied triplex and fourplex were worse. So FHA, 3.5% down was great. Sometimes FHA might require more down than 3.5, depending on your salary, the county that you're in, how much they'll lend, right? There's different requirements for that. Talk to your lender on that. But as of November 18th, 2023, Fannie and Freddie now have 5% down, backed single, house with ADU, duplex, triplex, and fourplex. So you can have fourplex with 5% down if you want. Conventional loan. So to answer your question, and I'm sorry I went off on kind of a, a tangent there, I just wanted to make sure that if people see whenever an FHA question comes up, to be really clear, like Ninja Vanish said, it's kind of a last option. If you can't do conventional, FHA will work for a house hack. I've never used it, don't want to. Um, and then move my chat. I see Ninja Vanish gifted a membership to Matt Motley. Welcome to the group, Matt. We have cookies on the dark side. Um, so yeah, it's an intent. It's a one year intend to occupy on the, on the owner occupied. Some lenders will change it ten months, and if you have a justifiable reason, like you change jobs, or some other reason why you can go and do it, you might be able to even do it shorter. But generally, you're going to want to save the down payment, stabilize the, the rental anyway. Um, I highly recommend the house hack. It's the reason I'm financially free. I wasn't making a lot of money and I had a lot of bad debt when I started. Um, did I ever, Steve, let me know if you want to know how I got around really bad debt to income ratio, low salary to get into that first house hack. If anybody wants to know, let me know. Uh, Ninja Man is showing up late. I'm going to have to go back and then listen to me on chipmunk speed while I've got this nasally sick voice, Oculus. What's your method to track mileage for tax purposes? D document, write it down. Um, there's a couple of apps on tracking mileage. I think most realtors have that. I just have a spreadsheet where I put in the miles and then at the end of the year, I re report to my CPA. It's on my, my spreadsheet, just the mileage that I drove. Very simple. Um, keep all gas receipts, track the mileage, give it all to the CPA and let them decide what we do with it. Ninja Vanish, try to keep your credit card balance from zero to under 15% of available if possible. If possible, Ninja Vanish, I would go for 10%. Breaking the 10% threshold can take up to 30 points off your score. So here's what I did. One of the one of the things I did to help get my score up is call your card company, ask for a higher um, limit, but don't spend more. Because the higher the limit, the lower the credit utilization that you're using. And at 10% is the threshold to go above. Maybe they've changed it to 15, but the last time I looked, uh, it was it was 10. So I shoot for that. And generally, if I use it, I pay it off immediately. So even if I used like $5,000 to buy siding or something, 
paid off. Wombat Striker, supply all the salt. I missed something. JMC, I'm working full time. How would you manage juggling real estate investing and work full time? So when I started investing up until 2022, I was a full time employee. The first years that I started, I was a CDL instructor working about 60 hours a week. I was slowly demoted down to president of the company, um, working 60 hours a week and then answering my phone 24 hours a day because we had just 60 employees as I grew the company. And I was a single parent with three kids. So how do you do this? One of the reasons that I'm doing my first and last Burr now is that Burr is not a friendly investing strategy for a new investor or for somebody who doesn't have a lot of time to manage the project. I wanted cash flowing deals from the MLS that needed very little work. So I hunted for deals on the MLS. And for the first 10 years, it was speed. I wanted my offer in within an hour or maybe two, if it was a weekend, of, an, of a listing hitting the MLS to try to get the offer in before the seller got a bunch of offers and went with someone else. And then about half my portfolio was acquired because I made my offer and they said, oh, we've already got an offer. We've accepted. And I said, great, keep my offer. It's in second position. If your first offer falls through, mine stands. Because a lot of times people were making offers really quick, just whatever, here's the offer. And then trying to beat the seller to death with, oh, more of this window's fogged out. So the whole place needs all new windows. I want you to take $30,000 off. My offer's no good anymore, right? So they have these huge things. My offer in second position took away negotiation power from those kind of buyers, but got me half my portfolio. Very little work. I send a handyman out, put in coded locks, motion sensor, LED lights, ask the tenants if there's something they want to have fixed. I'm buying places with have the inspection done. I know of all the places I ever purchased, only one needed more than $2,000 done to it when I purchased it. And that was because this one needed a roof. It didn't take any of my time. I got three estimates. Had it done, was done in a day. Like, so I knew that going in. But for the most part, I buy rent ready. And my preference, JMC, is currently occupied properties. The reason the binder strategy exists is because I wanted to buy properties where the rents were low. A seller was tired, just wanted out. Tenants have been ignored. So fixing small things like coded locks and lights and asking them what they want fixed means that they really think they understand. I'm going to take care of the place. So the binder strategy goes easier. So without having to do a rehab or hardly any work, I got a rent increase. And happy tenants. Happy tenants don't trash your property. Happy tenants don't leave. So let's take it to the next step. I, a, a lot of the um, a lot of the beginning of this video, I talked about all of the physical aspects of a rental that help limit tenant turnover. I want washer dryer hookups in there. I want a garage for more space. I want side by side units so less noise complaints. I want fenced yards for pet friendly. Right? What does this do? It helps limit tenant turnover. If you're working full time and raising kids, and I was a single dad, right, raising three kids. And it was my sacred duty to make sure 50% of them made it to the age of 18. So I call myself a success. Actually, if they're not on the poll or in prison, I think I won. So that was an overshare. Uh, I'll blame the water. Limited tenant turnover. Not a lot of work. Doesn't take a lot of time. The physical aspects of the property that help tenants stay in place Fenced yard, side-by-side -side units, it's not a unit to them. It's a unit to me because I'm counting. It's a home to them, right? You see the live, laugh, love on the walls. I've got a guy that... I lived in my duplex, and I'm... this was... My kids were moving out, single guy. I'm a gamer. I had D&D &D night at my house, right? And so my whole front room, there was no couch. There's no kitchen table, no dining table. There's a gaming table. Um, it, it's bachelor house. So I moved to the fourplex and I moved this retired veteran into there. And he's a uh, truck driver, retired veteran, but just a guy, another single guy. I moved him in there. I went over there and it looks like grandma's house. Like there's little doilies, you know, little the things on the armrests. And uh, he totally unbachelor padded the place. So very sad. But that's his house. Right. He's not going anywhere. We actually just re-signed a lease. And uh, I can't share because people know who that guy is. And he just did something that's going to keep him a tenant for a long time. 
the more ways to keep tenants in place, the less tenant turnover, the less rehabs, the less work you're going to have to do. The systems of having, you know, from my course of having like several handymen that or when when they haven't dealt with the tenant yet, they, they interact with me, the tenant and the handyman through a group text or email until they have an interaction with the tenant and I see if their personalities get along. And if they get along great, then the tenant is instructed that for most concerns, you can contact the handyman directly. If it's $500 or less, it doesn't re involve in place replacing appliances or making upgrades to the house, just fixing the damage to something. The handyman does it and then bills me. So I monitor the group thing, but I'm not involved in it. If it's above 500, the handyman will reach out and we'll have a little conversation. So I have tenants I've interacted with once or twice in four years. GMC, that's my investing strategy. I call it the lazy investor because I think lazy is a little more catchy, but really it's the busy investor. Are you working full time? Do you have a side hustle? Do you have kids to raise? Are you able to keep a woman around? Do you have that superpower I've never developed? Maybe you don't want to be, because I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm just not. I'm an investor. I took my money. And this is a concept I like to teach as well. I've never spent money on a rental. I've moved money. I took money out of the bank and I put it in the rental with a down payment, right? T take money out of the bank, build a wall in a rental. So now that's a three bedroom instead of a two bedroom. That money's still there. The value of the property went up. It's still my money. I can do a cash out, a HELOC, sell for 1031. Haven't done any of those, but I can get that money if I want it. It's still my money. I've never spent money buying a rental. I've only moved it. In such a way that takes the least amount of my time. My actual goal, if you've watched me on the Three Amigos in the last week, you know this goal. So sorry to hear you have you hear it twice. You know how people make resolutions. You want to do this in 2024. You want to buy a rental. You want to... Uh, Take a course you want to interact with three and um, new investors, whatever your goals are. Awesome. Here's my goal. I have one goal for 2024. I want to spend more time out of the United States than in the United States. And this is not because I don't love the United States. I love the country. I served in the Marine Corps, went to Desert Storm, Desert Shield. I've defended the country. I've I love the country. It's not that I want to leave the country. It's that I want to travel. I retired to travel. So my goal in 2024 is to be gone more than I'm here while self-managing 18 rental units. That's how you invest if you work full-time. Great question, thank you. Jared, in Arizona, they stated I needed a year of history to pay an average every month. I asked to speak to a supervisor and told them I will pay $200 a month, even though my initial average was around 130. Jared, what is that related to? Is that, were you using the thing that's like him, Lane? Sorry, I missed it. Also, Happy New Year to you and everyone in the chat. Thank you, JMC. So I'm sorry, Jared, I missed the con the connection. In Arizona, they stated I needed a year of history to pay an average every month. Oh, for the utilities. I didn't get the average every month to, to find out what I was paying. I wanted to know basically if it was $47 a month, if I charge the tenants 55, that will cover the spiky months. I pay whatever the actual payment is. So it's not even an average. That's probably an option I've never asked. Um, I averaged it out for the tenants. Sorry that it took me 10 seconds to put that together. I accepted it. I'm going to have a high power bill in the summer due to AC. Yep ask you may be able to make it happen that's one of the main reasons i want as many utilities in the tenant's name as possible because you don't want the tenant to say hey you can come over and talk to us anytime you want the door's open and the ac or the heater's on at the same time ben howdy now that you are 50k in reserves do you still use 50 percent gross savings in your yield calculation yes so i have got a video on my channel called how much in reserves it's probably a couple years old now I don't know if I need to make a new one because really only things change as I've retired since then. And I think I even covered that in there. So when we run the yield calculation, I don't, I'm not actually looking for what am I going to make, right? I'm not trying to figure out, okay, my cash flow is going to be this because cash flow and yield are two different things. I want to know the yield so I can compare as close to apples to apples as possible, five different properties, right? I can look at pet friendly, side by side, all those other things right on each one individually. But the yield, I can look at there and go, 
This one gets an eight, this one gets a six, this one gets a 10, this one gets a 10, this one gets a five. Okay, so I'm gonna look at these two tens, right? They just stand out mathematically as the ones to look at. I'm not curious, looking at how much I'm going to make. I'm in an expensive area, right? My, my cheapest properties were, my cheapest property was 290,000. So there are places where you can buy properties less than that. Millennial Mike, I think, bought one for 25 or 28,000. Right, so there's the, the whole range of places. There are places where they heard I bought a duplex for 290,000 and you thought, wow, that's the down payment where we live, right? So there's a whole spectrum of the markets out there. The reason that I still calculate the 15% in my calculation is because I want to know that asset by itself is self-sustaining. That doesn't mean that only the money from my fourth property is going to pay for the roof on the fourth property, right? My cat, my money is all put together. I simplify this, but I could skip another ad. Oh, it's popping up now. I never did that before. When I had seven or less properties, seven or less units, I kept 10,000 in reserve, right? I wanted to be able to place a roof, a couple of water heaters, go through an eviction, whatever. Seven units or less, I, there's only one or two of those things was gonna happen at the same time, 10 grand was enough. So everything above 10,000, I wanted to put to work. So it didn't come to me for cash flow to live my life. It kept going into the investing fund, which made the next investment happen sooner. So the 10,000 was there as a reserve, but the properties were still producing that 15% that I'm not using. When I went from seven to 16 units, I increased it to $30,000. Murphy's fourth corollary, right? Murphy's law, if anything can go wrong, it probably will. Fourth corollary, if any sequence of events can go wrong, they probably will and in the worst possible order. Meaning I can have two roofs and a garage and an eviction all at the same time with 16 units, right? So $30,000 was enough for me to have that swan sleep well at night account while I had a W-2. But once it got to 30, again, 15% of gross rents is being set aside for future repairs, maintenance, and vacants. That reserve account is full. That money comes out and goes into the investing fund, making the next investment happen faster. So did the 15% continue to go to the reserve account? No, but it didn't come to me. It went to the investing fund. So that if the reserve was used and then the 15% needed to be used to refill it, and most times that was never even the case. It was just Cash flow would take care of the problems. When I retired and I lost the security of the drug that kills dreams, a paycheck, I increased it to 50,000. So that reserve account sits there, 50,000. Any money coming in, well, it's full, is funneled into future investments. So great question. Um, I still calculate the 15%. Matt has over 100 units in his portfolio and he doesn't. So he can look at a deal without having to do that. It's a very different animal and never, not never, the less a man makes declarative statements, the less apt he is to look foolish in retrospect. Try not to compare year 10 or 23 like Matt to year one to five. It was a Tarantino quote, by the way. Wombat striker. And my chat moved. I guess my question didn't post. Maybe I missed it. I'm very sorry. If I ever miss a question, just repost it. You've seen, I read pretty much all the comments, so I don't ever skip questions. For water softeners, some require special types, pellets versus crystals. How would you handle that? Note on lid as an example bag or several, or do you buy it, all of it? I have never used water softeners. And if um, where I have septic, I don't allow it. Where I have sewer, I don't care. So I don't provide it. Don't know any of my tenants that use it. Um, I have the conversation with tenants that can't use water softeners, can't use flushable wipes. Flushable wipes don't work with septic systems. And if they're found in there, the tenant is responsible for all maintenance and repairs caused by it. Um, yeah, so maybe it's know what's local, know what's required, know if it's normal, right? I think that there are some towns that have water issues and use totally different filtering systems that are used or whatever. It's not a Washington thing. Our problem here is that there's too much water. We don't have a drought and currently we don't have bad water because it's filtered so fast with the rain. Jada, sorry, I meant to say use your credit card points to cash out for cash or redeem for travel points, which most cards multiply the points for when you redeem the points and use them for travel. Yeah, so I'll use the card for points, but I've never used it to purchase a house. I've used it for everything else. All that or higher, all done roofing. 
traveling home now. Travel safe. Glad you made it. Roofing sucks. My brother roofs his own roofs because, and I've said this in videos before, he can't stand the one thing roofers are proud of. So he does it all himself. And weirdly, every time he's roofed, I'm invited over and I end up carrying roofing crap up a ladder for him. <laughs> Figure I'd learn my lesson. Steven, howdy. FHA is your last resort in almost all cases in Indivadish. Thank you. It is for your primary residence. Rob, howdy. Dion's to blame for me buying a jet ski, or at least that's the story I'm sticking with. I... So who said this about a boat? It was in a chat on one rental at a time. Um, being retired, I could go and buy a boat. Totally, just go buy it, all cash. I'd rather rent one. So yes, I can own a jet ski. I'd rather rent one. Um, and you're, Rob's probably referring to the video that I did on Cleelum Lake uh, when I was staying at Beth Traverso's vacation rental, which everybody should check out. I should put a link in the chat below. Um, rented a jet ski, went out there and did a video on why the affordability index is flawed. And nobody listened to me. Tiffany, howdy. Demoted down to the vice, no, demoted down to the president um, and we had to create the position, create the vice presidents for the other things. Um, I had a couple of ideas that exponentially exploded the growth of the CDL school. So I got demoted down to president. I like teaching. I was happy in the truck, but apparently I'm okay at talking to people. So I go on base and into prisons and I'd give uh, presentations. And there's a video on my channel where you can see why your resume is not working. That video that concept exploded the growth of our school. And then I developed a nonprofit called TPS, Transportation Placement Services, for all the non-driving positions in trucking. Every trucking company has HR, IT, operations, logistics, warehouse, every position you can imagine that nobody's applying for because you don't think of going to work in IT for Pepsi. But Pepsi employs 151,000 more people than the state of Washington does. And how many people do you think in Washington want to work for the state? Right. So there's all of those non-driving positions. So I had these ideas, created a nonprofit, and somehow when a company starts making a bunch of money, they make you the boss. And I was happy in the truck. KS, howdy. Would you still put an offer on a property that is pending? Yes, I actually had a conversation with a friend uh, like a week ago, who's under contract on a property now, different one than we were talking about. Um, so I should reach out to him, ask him how it's going. Um, we'll do that later. Because he had his home inspection. I'll, I'll have to look at that. He's buying primary, not house hack. Just you know, get on the property ladder, not making an investment, buying a home. And when he was making offers on properties, he said, there's this one I really like, but it's already pending. And I said, well, that's why you make the offer. Half my portfolio was acquired because they were already accepting another offer. Don't send an email saying, well, I'd pay 400000 for it. Just send a docu-signed offer from your agent saying, look, this is the offer. My, you know, They're already pending. No, don't do it a bunch. This is the one that's a great deal that you would follow through on. On it and a number that you think the seller would take even if, the, if they weren't pending. Right? So if it's brand new on the market, don't make a lowball offer. But if it's been on the market for 100 days and they just went pending, I'd make your lowball offer. Half my portfolio was acquired by being in second position. So yeah, I would. Clear communication with your agent. Make sure they're okay with it. And if they're not, you find a new agent. Doesn't mean that's a bad person. It just means that you have a strategy they don't want to use. Franco, howdy. Is there PMI on owner-occupied conventional loans? Yes, if you put less than 20% down. However, not all lenders are made the same. In 1999 or 2000, when I purchased my first house, years before I was an investor, right? I was just buying, the like my friend, house with a picket fence to raise the kids in um, before the tragedy that happened in the rest of that experience, not the house, the marriage. I'm not bitter. Uh, we had an owner-occupied Conventional loan, zero down, no PMI, walked away from the closing table with a check for $1,200. Catch, adjustable rate mortgage. So learned my lesson, and it was 105% levered. So we wrapped the closing costs. 
into the loan. Like, so those products exist every now and then. There's there's first time home buyer incentive programs where Bank of America was given $17,000. Um, the California had that recent one where they contributed towards the down payment. So you want to talk to lenders about what's available, what you qualify for. Um, and mortgage insurance on, from some lenders I've heard is at five or 10 or 15%. So it's not always 20. That's kind of the standard, right? And you can't have a standard unless there's exceptions. Legacy, howdy. But I would buy all the products for the softener and then check on the periodically to communicate with tenants. There you go. Frank, howdy. What is the benefit of only having to put 3% down if your monthly payment is going to be higher? I put 5% down on my duplex and had mortgage insurance and my payment was higher. And here, let me, let me say this in, a, in as non a mean way as possible. Because I was broke. It took two years for me to save 5% down. Yes, putting more down would have increased cash flow. Sometimes decreasing yield, putting more down. Um, things have changed, right? Don't compare year one to year 10, but this property that I'm in right now, I paid $400,000 cash. The weirdest thing ever. Closing documents are five pieces of paper. Like I've had a loan on every property and I've refinanced. There's usually a stack. $200 mobile notary to come and sign however many pages a stack for a purchase is. $200 mobile notary to do five pages. Good racket. So the benefit to 3% down is sometimes that's all people have. And yeah, you, you would cash flow more with more with more down. But if you're owner occupied, you get a better interest rate than if you're buying an investment property. So I want as much low interest fixed rate debt as possible. Right, right now I have about one point, this last little less than this, $1.8 million in fixed rate debt. Property values are over $6 million. So I have a net worth of about $3 million. So if I sold, paid agent fees, paid gains, paid depreciation recapture, I walk away with that much more than $3 million. I don't do that. I'm not going to sell anything, not for another decade or two. I think Millennium Mike's going to buy it all owner-financed owner anyway. But that's why the down payment, I might want to put more down. I, I The reason I haven't used my VA loan is I don't want to go up to five. So if I ever see a screaming deal on a five unit, I eliminate most of the competition that wants to do residential because the average person is limited to four. Most veterans don't know the VA loan will go up to five. So I have a smaller pool to compete against because then I'm competing against investors that are getting um, DSCR or convention, uh, um, commercial loans that have higher interest rate balloon periods, loan reevaluation periods, like all of the negatives that I don't want on my lending. So I'm, I've kept my VA and not used it for that reason. Those reasons, pluralize, pluralize that. So Frank, there are different reasons. Um, why did I buy cash on this one? It's really kind of the worst return for your money uh, because I had the money and I don't want a bunch of more units. We made a video earlier today on, on with the three amigos on how do you know what enough is? And I think a superpower I have is I know what enough is. My investing strategy is not to have the biggest portfolio or to have the best cash on cash return. My investing strategy was I wanted it to take 10 years or less. I wanted the right amount of cash flow from the least amount of units. And there is no one right answer, Frank. 3% down might be the perfect answer for somebody else. 20 might be the perfect answer for a house hack from somebody else. What funds do they have to um, put to work? How much of an increase to their cash flow are they looking for? Julie, howdy. Good to see you. Are your kids interested in real estate yet? My kids accuse me of real estate indoctrination. No, I have one daughter. I, I have three kids, two daughters and a son. I have one daughter who's curious and is starting to make maybe like a five-year plan to get a duplex. I have a son who um, got married, married well, right? The two of them, Knocked out, he, he had $54,000 in student loans, auto loans, whatever, bad debt, right? Yes, I call student loans bad debt. They took one year and eliminated it. Awesome. 
in a year, that meant they could have saved $50,000. Maybe even more now because they're not paying interest on the 54 that they had to beat down. But they are just not interested in real estate. They they watched a lot of my stuff to get to understand frugality, to understand the, in, the debt snowball method from Dave Ramsey. So they benefited from Dave Ramsey so as much as as much crap as I give Dave Ramsey. My son probably benefited a lot from his theories, but I can't get them on the property ladder. They they get ten grand buy a car, you know, the down payment for a car. They they get another ten grand. They go to Disneyland. They're they're, they're planning the big next thing is Disney Japan wherever it's i think it's japan and, and they're living they're they're early you know they're 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 not old right so they're they're enjoying life totally get it and julie i don't judge i made it to 40 without ever having a thousand dollars in the bank never thinking about money basically putting the control in my spouse's hands which was a break. it's kind of like i ran a martial arts studio in california um when my kids were young and and if they were interested they can come and participate but they were never like students they were forced in on them um, and now I do defensive tactics training. Um, and my son was on the wrestling team and my daughters were in gymnastics. So like whatever their interests are, I encourage, I'm not trying to direct them. Uh, yeah. Again, one of the reasons I'm on YouTube is so I can interact with people who think this way about finances, who care about financial freedom. And that is often not our friends or family. I worked at that CDL school and grew it up to from one location with six staff to five locations with 60. So over a decade, closer to 40 to 60 staff as it was growing. Two, two people total in that entire decade I worked there invested in real estate. It, actually, it finally got the owners to invest in the last couple of years. And when they realized that we can't even pay this guy enough to keep him around. They could they could have offered me a million dollars a year. I wouldn't have stayed. I had $2 million hand, golden handcuffs. I still walked away. Because cash flow sets us free. And so, yeah, Julie, do I hope my kids get in? Yes. Do I tell my kids often that when I'm 75, I'm going to marry an 18-year-old? They get everything. So my kids' inheritance is not going to be a retirement coming from me dying. Um, so that they're motivated to go do it on their own? Yes. Um, but no. Not interested, not making moves yet. Ninja, thanks for wrenching the chat. Thank you. Franzo, what's your thoughts on rentals and HOA communities? I will not own an HOA. Uh, I own one in an HOA because I bought a house before I was an investor. I hate it. I, I, this is an overshare. Sorry for the overshare. I will blame it on the water. A part of me is very petty. Never been good at keeping a woman around, but I was good about keeping custody of my kids, divorces, and I was good about keeping the house. So since I helped kept the house in, in a divorce, even though it doesn't make the best financial sense, I'm not selling it. Even though it's in an HOA, which I would never own a rental in an HOA, I'm not selling it. Super petty. Sorry for the overshare. The HOA fees are, are not the problem, although they can only go up. I've never heard of HOA fees going down. It's possible, but I've never seen it or heard of it myself in real life. Heard of it in like choose FI groups where they get on the board and they vote and they you can, you can do that. Or Matt, I think, bought like a six flex and he owned, had to own enough of the units to where now he's the board and he can do whatever he wanted. So there are ways to do it. But two main problems with an HOA. First, based on my own personal experience. HOA boards are made up of busy bodies who have nothing better to do than to F with their neighbors. And if you're in the good old boys club, you can have a dumpster, you can make your fence whatever color you want. But if you're not, and you have uh, you try to be an entrepreneur or try a business and you put a dumpster at your house, can't do it because it's in the CCNRs, but the guy down the street can. So you can get fines for things that other people in the HOA can do. Very irritating. Don't want where you live or where you have rentals at to be a problem. Second thing, based on personal experience, Random assessments. So the lumberjack landlord had a random assessment uh, of 70,000 plus. So he had to sell to somebody who was okay with that being a part of the deal uh, because they had to replace all the siding on the whole place where he was at. Um, I had random assessments because the house that I purchased is at a lake with lake access and docks and other things. And they had, it was like four grand. So it wasn't a lot, but $4,000, significant expense on something that I might not have wanted done. 
So those are my reasons for not wanting an HOA. Now, here's an experience from a friend of mine. So this is not a me story, but it's a story I know well enough to know the details. He owned a rental for about five years, had a tenant in there almost the whole time. Tenant moves out, goes to re-rent it, HOA won't lend him because the HOA only allowed, it was either 10 or 20% of the per percentage of houses in the HOA could be rentals. The rest had to be owner-occupied. When he purchased, they were under the threshold. In the five years of that tenant living there, the HOA had let it go above the threshold. So anytime a tenant moved out, that landlord had three options. Leave it vacant, move into it, or sell it. That's a dumb one. All kinds of reasons why HOAs don't make sense. Now, there are people who prefer to invest in HOAs, who have the time to go and, and, and desire to get on the board and to impact the HOA. Sure. Can the strategy work? Absolutely. Is it a strategy I will do? No. JMC, this is a great question, and normally I don't do this, okay? So JMC, who is on your team? Contractors, handyman, real estate agents, lenders. Who do you think are vital to have as an investor? Let me look at something. Let me entertain you. Um, as we're wrapping this up here in a minute, I'm going to put a link to a video for JMC. This is a live stream that I did about a week ago. When was this? Real estate investing without a team. The reason I'm able to retire early, the reason I have the cash flow that I do is because I don't want a team. Made a video with uh, the three amigos this morning with um, Michael Zuber and the Lumberjack Landlord, giving them a chance to come at me and say, here's my team. And this is why it matters to me. And they had some brilliant answers. That video should be coming out Thursday in future land. Except when you watch it, it will be future land. And Millennial Mike, I'm hoping, he said he was going to, is going to come at me with why his team is so, now he invests at a distance. And I do clarify, if you invest at a distance, here's the people on your team that are going to matter. I invest locally. I don't want a team. I want my agents to work for my money. I want my lenders to hate the fact that I reached out because they know they have to compete with other lenders. And I want to do bids with contractors because a contractor, even a good one, will give you different prices based on whether they have two days worth of work lined up or two months worth of work lined up. So I want estimates from different places. So it's a good question, JMC, and most real estate investing strategies take a team. Mine doesn't. Specifically, I am successful because the people that other people would call on my team don't like me. Now, yeah, I do have three or four handymen that I work with and tip very well so that I can ha call them in emergencies. So I would say I have a team, but not one of them is the team. They're all. And, and anytime I don't have one of them available, I use the Thumbtack app to hire somebody immediately so I can read reviews, get quotes, find contractors or handymen. Good question. I'm putting the chat down here and I'm probably going to go through the questions and be wrapping up here because... The voice has had it. So if you have a, a question that you just have to get out, um, you can super chat it and it'll come to the top. Or I will be back Tuesday next week, 4 p.m. Pacific, to answer all questions. Um, also, if you like live streams, uh, Lumberjack Landlord, Sunday mornings, 8.30 Pacific. He does a live stream like this, answers all the questions. Um, he has really good info, too. If you're not watching him, you should be checking him out. Yes, Jesse Scott, even you. Um, let me get through a couple of questions here before I'm done. Um, JMC was the team. All night, hiders done the roofing. Let me see if you want that. I buy furnace filters. I do buy furnace filters. Drop them off. That usually gives my handyman or me once in a while any reason to walk through a rental. Hamlet, how was your confidence starting out? Did you experience doubt or hesitation with those first couple of deals? Thanks. <clears throat> I wish my voice wasn't going because I would want to do like a 10 minute answer to this. So I'm going to do a very concise answer for you, Hamlet. Thank you for answering the question. I appreciate it. It's just, it sucked. Uh, the first year I was so bad, I tried to give up. I, no kidding. Didn't try to sell. I tried to give, give away my house. I reached out to a friend who was an agent. And I said, hey, look, do you know anybody who wants a house? Just, just list it, give it away. 
they, they could do subject to, they could do a wrap, they could buy it, they could do whatever. I don't even want to make a penny. They could just have it. I, I hate this so bad because I moved into an apartment to do several things. This is how I got around my debt to income problem. I moved into an apartment, saved for two years. So two years of saving, that's two, not that, that's two. Two years of saving to get the down payment, closing costs, money for immediate repairs and reserves that lenders were going to require. Two years of working as a CDL instructor because it was a new field. So that satisfied their need for that. Two years of rental income on my tax return so that they can look at the rental income of the duplex and my debt to income ratio so that I can get around my bad debt to income ratio. But that first year, I lost six grand owning that rental, all factors included. And I, I'm still friends with the guy because like, this was my fault, not his fault. I rented to a guy because when you first start out, my confidence was so, so low. Here's what I was thinking. <laughs> Very sorry, this is my Cliff Notes edited version of a short way to answer a question. Who can rent to a stranger? How do you trust them? So I rented to a friend. And if you have a friend who needs a lease, right? So just handshake. Now he's a single parent. I'm a single parent. Life's rough as a single parent. I wasn't making a lot. He wasn't making a lot. So he rent got late. Late became never. I didn't even push it because I know how life could be sometimes, right? Go to the house to go, hey, why aren't you paying the rent? Have a face-to-face -face conversation. We actually worked together, but I didn't talk about rental at work. I talked about him at his house. Go there. He doesn't live there. He had moved out and rented the house to someone else, was keeping the rent. New tenants had trashed the place, put in half a wall, um, doors, just everything was messed up. Flooring was messed up. Uh, I, I really sat back and said, here's my confidence level. I can't do this. I suck at this because I didn't do the thing you're doing right now. I thought... I'm going to replace my income because that was the first step. That's That was a mistake. We don't need to replace our income. We need to figure out what our freedom number is and then figure out what our multiplier of that is to reach financial freedom. It has nothing to do with how much you make. It's how much you spend and how much of a multiplier of that you need. So <laughs> I was going to do that with no education at all. Sounds smart, right? It, it took 13 weeks of boot camp to become a Marine. It took six month academy to become a law enforcement officer. It, it took you know, years because my degree wasn't done in four years. It was done in lots of years because I clept most of my classes, correspondence courses, and the Marine Corps paid for most of it, even though I didn't have the GI Bill. Because you had to pay for it back in the dinosaur days. And that was too cheap to do that. But if you want to work in a field that needs a degree, look at the years of commitment that takes. And I'm just going to replace my income. That was the first thought again um, with no training. No mentor, no courses, no books, no YouTube university. It was the dumbest thing I did. One of the top 53 dumb things I've ever done. So my confidence was that bad. Luckily, because there is some luck involved in this, the 2008 housing crash happened. Home values had gone down. I owed at the time $138,000 on my house. Houses like it were selling for hundred. I couldn't even find somebody who would take the house for free because the mortgage on it was worth more than what they could buy another house for. So I was stuck with it. A little bit of research, YouTube University, Rich Dad Poor Dad, Bigger Pockets. Not until 2018, but one rental at a time. Had I found him six years earlier, it would have been a lot easier to do everything I did because most of what he teaches in his book is actually what I did. Um, through trial and error to get to the point where that was what it looked like. So confidence in the beginning was terrible. Earlier in this video, video Hamlet, I talked, uh, I answered a question about how these four words can give you the confidence to move on. Confidence to move on. Confidence comes from competence. When you are competent at saving, you've increased your income, you didn't allow your expenses to increase, and you can save money every month. The competence at that will give you the confidence to look at your credit score. When you get your credit score above 650 for the first time, in, in the 600s for the first time, the competence at knowing how to pay attention to and, and you know, massage your credit score higher gives you the confidence to then go talk to a lender because now you don't sound like you don't know what you're doing. You can actually say, I know what my credit score is. I know how much I can save every month. I know how much I have in reserves. Now you talk to the lender. The lender tells you what all your options are, which is how I need to go rent an apartment and rent my house out. Doing that gave me the confidence because I was developing the competence and all of the little things along the way. 
watching this video, learning the skills. How do you run the numbers on a deal? How do you know if a property is going to help you limit tenant turnover? How do you know if it's a good or a bad market? How do you know if the debt is going to work? You know, all the little things that you're learning will give you the competence that gives you the confidence. Thank you. Is it you or is the sound going off and on? I don't know. My mic's probably too far away. And my voice is going. So, sorry about that. I'm probably going to be wrapping up there. Wayne Wong, wouldn't that be taken out of their deposit charged after they move out? Uh, buddies, my two-year tenant has broken a few things that have needed to be fixed. How do I charge them for these items? Example, broken toilets, door jams, uh, light fixtures. So if it's if it's a door jam, I usually charge, right? And you just invoice them. A bill, go to invoice.com. You can print out an invoice. Name it whatever you want. They're very easy to do. Um, broken toilet, depending on if it's like if it wobbled loose because of time, that's a you thing. If they break the porcelain because they dropped something on it, that's a them thing. Light fixture, how did it break? Again, is it wear and tear? Is it something that they threw or, or whatever? You invoice them. The next comment down is, wouldn't that be taken out of their deposit charged after they move out? No. You can do that. I recommend that you don't. I want the deposit sitting there as a teaser that they can get money back if they leave it in good condition. If a person goes, I have a $2,000 deposit. They, they've probably billed me $5,000 for the breaks in the last two years. So they're going to keep all my deposit. Most tenants, most tenants don't expect to get the deposit back, but don't expect to be pursued for damages above the deposit. And if they are, they just try to leave no contact or ignore you because, you know, is it really worth taking them to small claims court to get a judgment? Yes, some people will follow through, but high percentage of the time they won't, right? So there's a, a lot of tenants that will undo that. I want that hanging there as a, I really want you to get your deposit back. Here are the things I want you to do to do that. My last two or three tenants, because I've only had five tenant turnovers in 13 years now, uh, all but one got all of their deposit back, right? Dirty place, I don't care. It's going to be dirty. Carpet messed up, I don't care because if there was carpet when I bought it, There's, <clears throat> it's been there long enough for that's going to be bad anyways and get pulled out. I do have a tenant who has broken doors and not the jams, the doors, and she put tape over it and I offered to replace them and then bill her and she said no, that, uh, that kids would just break them again. So when she moves out, she said, take it out of the deposit. I'm like, well, if it's safe, Clean and functional. I don't care. It just looks weird. I don't live there. You live there. So yeah, buddies, I would invoice them. You have a lease, right? In the lease somewhere, there should be a damages clause that the tenant is responsible for certain things. If it's, you know, small, 100 bucks, 150 bucks, sometimes I won't invoice them, but I will communicate through an email. Here's the expense of this um, thing. Um, and then maybe not pursue for payment so that if it becomes a recurring thing, you can then pursue. Christine, howdy, happy new year. Sounds like asking, this one looks good. Where was that question? Happened after I moved the microphone. I probably messed the microphone up. Do I have sound now? Yeah. Okay, good. Oculus, someday we'll see. I used to do four-hour live streams, but most people didn't want to watch them, so I tried to limit it to two. So we're two hours and nine minutes on a day where my voice is going. Um, on how to create your own HOA and put a lien on your property that supersedes even the IRS, but you got to know how. There are other constitutionalist things that you can do too. I'm way too lazy to do any of that. Um, I will be wrapping up there as the voice is gone. Ninja Vanish, anyone needing to work on their credit score should download the Experian app. It will give you your real time FICO 8 score free if you do not need upgrade and free trial. Awesome, great advice. 
Thank you all for hanging out with me on a Tuesday where my voice was coming and going and my mic was coming and going. So great combination. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk.